Good afternoon and welcome to Gwinnett County Public Library's Meet the Author series. Thank you for coming out today. Today's author is Tom Poland, and you can see one of his books right there on the table. He is a photojournalist, an author, and a very uh, sought after public speaker. Today he's going to talk about one of his books where he has revisited the disappearing traditions. The book is called The Last Sunday Drive, Vanishing Traditions in Georgia and the Carolinas. He has several other books as well, and they are for sale over there at that table. With us today, um, after his talk, those books will continue to be for, available for sale and signing. And I'd like to welcome you to Tom Poland. Thank you, and, and thank you all for coming here today. The Back Roads has been a focus of mine now for about six, six or seven years. And um, it started because of my mother's declining health and death. I was going to Georgia from Columbia, South Carolina, where I live. I'm from Georgia. It's, it's good to be back here in Georgia, too, by the way. And I would spend 72-hour shifts with her on weekends to give my sisters a break. They live right next door to taking care of her. And um, it's very stressful. <laughs> and so when I would leave to go back to my home in Irmo, South Carolina, Sometimes I wouldn't take the same old road. I started rambling and taking back roads and avoiding the interstate and avoiding very busy roads where mostly what you see are development and construction, um, modern architecture. Uh, I call this region Georgia Lina. That's why I have that book over there named Georgia Lina Southland. So this is the book that I did called The Last Sunday Drive. And the reason I did it was twofold. One, to sort of lament the passing of what was a great tradition, especially if you were a kid. If you grew up in the country where I did, where there was nothing but pine trees and creeks, which was great places to play, you still nonetheless didn't see much. For example, there were no railroad tracks or trains in my county. And we'd go into South Carolina, we'd start seeing trains, which was, to a young boy, was a marvelous thing. You counted the cars. How many, you know? You can advance. There were places that my mom and dad talked about is great places to go on vacations. See Rock City was one. Rock City up near Lookout Mountain. This is the Rock City barn in Abbeville, South Carolina on Highway 28. It's the only Rock City barn in South Carolina. It's the real deal. You don't see those like you used to because Lady Bird Johnson's Highway Beautification Act banned certain forms of advertising and in most states they considered that a form of advertising. They painted over these picturesque rooftops on barns so you couldn't see, see Rock City anymore. And there we lost sort of an icon of the South. It was a great place to go. I think Ruby Falls was nearby. It was a great vacation des uh, destination. And for a kid on a Sunday afternoon with nothing to do, I was the oldest. My sister was younger than I were. I had nobody to play with. The Sunday drive was a marvelous time for me for seeing grandparents, relatives, and others who might live outside the county, I got to see, in other words, a little bit of the world. Cemeteries for people are interesting places. If you were to go on a Sunday drive today, I would direct you to go to Durham, North Carolina, to this cemetery for horses and mules that a farmer by the name of Fabius Page, Fab Page, loved so much. He loved his mules and horses, and when they died, he had a cemetery tombstone made for them like you would your grandparents or parents. If you'll pay attention to this one, I don't guess you can see it, but black is misspelled about four lines down, B-A-L-C-K. Well, you can't re really fix a typo and grant it that easily, so they, they, went, they went ahead with it, you know. And um, the thing about this particular tombstone, the cemetery, is he had himself buried among his beloved horses and mules without a marker. So what did this mean? It meant they couldn't come in there and bulldoze it and build some building on it. It's a cemetery. Behind what used to be this wonderful farm is a thousand person capacity apartment complex. In front and below of it down a ridge is I-540 in Raleigh-Durham. In Fabius Page's day, that stretch of road was a dirt road and on July 4th, they would eat watermelon and race their horses and mules. That's what they did on 4th of July. So there's a deeper meaning behind these back roads that we need to think about, and that these are vestiges of how people used to live. They didn't have TV. 
They didn't have digital phones. They didn't have all the stuff that we take for granted. It quite frankly drives me insane sometimes. I believe the devil invented the cell phone. You can't get away from people. But that's a beautiful old cemetery on a ridge. There's about 13 different uh, burials there, horses and mules. And he would say, for Bessie, gentle in nature, and give you some of his sentiment for how he loved these, these farm animals. The Southern Stonehenge, Elberton, Georgia. The Georgia Guidestones. I'm sure some of you know about that already. How many of you have been there? Okay. I've been there three or four times. It's an interesting story behind this. It was built in 1980. These are massive granite columns. There's seven different languages inscribed into them, and they have rules for how you should live. Avoid politicians is one of them. Keep the Earth's population at a very low level, and it's a very ridiculously low number they've got. I can't remember. I think it's like a million and a half. And there was some association with this by some people that said it was a satanic place of worship. And so for a long time, people would come in there and paint graffiti on it and vandalize the place. And then they started cleaning it up, putting in security cameras and lights. I've never been there that wasn't four or five, six or seven people there looking at the Southern Stonehenge. A Mr. Christian, supposedly anonymous name, came in there in 1980 and paid the uh, companies there to put up these massive slabs of granite with these words and chiseled into, chiseled into them. And he didn't want his identity known. One man, a banker in Elberton, Georgia, supposedly knew who he was. And the scuttlebutt says it might have been, possibly was, Ted Turner. Does that sound like something Ted would do? I don't know. But it's quite a place to see. And my mom and dad would have taken us there on a Sunday drive because it's only about 40 minutes from where I grew up. And it's certainly a place that's worth seeing today. If you haven't been there, you should make a trip to Elberton, Georgia, to the Southern Stonehenge, Guidestones of the South. This is on Highway 378 in South Carolina, which used to be the main road from the Columbia, South Carolina region to Atlanta here, this area, before I-20 came along. The devilish I-20, which is full of armed construction barrels, <laughs> wrecks, lane closures. I tell people, if you'll get on a back road compared to an interstate, two things happen. Your gas mileage goes up and your blood pressure goes down. It's much more enjoyable. You see things that are worth seeing, and you see places like this. This is an old post office that a gentleman by the name of Logue, Bill Logue, Billy Logue, moved to his property and took it upon himself to be what I call a do-it-yourself curator. He created his own museum, all these old signs, hay rakes up front. I stopped by there one day just to knock on their door and ask them if I could take some photographs. And he says, I'll show you the inside. I went inside this store, this old post office, and there were things I hadn't seen since I was like five years old. Old cash registers, a, a, a cheese slicer, old Coca-Cola signs, crates of old bottles, uh, five gallon cans of farm oil and lubricant for tractors and things I never see anymore. And he has a history there of how the world was handled in those days as agriculture went on Highway 378 at the Edgefield Saluda County line. It was a wonderful place to photograph. I know you can't quite see it right, but it's an old clapboard, longleaf pine structure. If you were to take some of the lumber off that, plane it off, you'd have the most beautiful heart pine wood you can imagine for furniture. And I know some people, some guys that salvage these places like this and make beautiful furniture out of it. But all these old signs, you know, this is the kind of thing American pickers look like. The concern I have with this place is that they haven't been stolen yet because people will go around and steal old signs. I found that out the hard way by writing about a place. And I went there one day to see this massive 7-Up sign, and it was gone. Now, I don't know if the owner took it, or more likely somebody read my book, found it, and took it. So I have to be careful now when I tell people where places are. I don't always tell them. Do you remember the chain gang? You remember Sam Cooke's song? been working on the chain gang. This is a chain gang camp on Highway 25, Edgefield, South Carolina. It's been abandoned for many a day. This pretty lady over there and I went to it 
and took photographs. In a window outside where there were a bunch of rusty crossbars was an old butcher knife. It had been in that windowsill for I don't know how long, and I wondered about that knife being in a chain gang camp. We went inside it. There was one metal cot left where the men would sleep. There was a huge eye bolt of steel embedded in the floor, and I was told they were all chained to that eye bolt at night when they slept. When they died, they were buried out back. It's about 21 or 30 or so graves, unmarked. The Edgefield Historical Society has taken it upon itself to identify these men and give them a proper name, and so some now have names. But it's a fascinating place to see a vestige of the 1950s, the chain gang. I remember seeing them when we would take these Sunday drives, not Sunday drives, but back road drives. You could actually see the men picking up the litter and doing things. There are some today who say we should bring the chain gang back, and some states have in some ways. You see litter patrols picking up. But this is a classic old building. It's got a facade on it. You almost expect somebody to ride up on a horse like a cowboy, like Clint Eastwood in some western. You know, It's got that kind of feel about it. You can't see it from the highway, trees screen it, and it's in, the, in the wintertime you can see a, a bit more of it. And I've taken photo clubs there, I've taken people on trips there. It's a fascinating glimpse into the 50s of what a chain gang camp looked like. And by the way, these blocks of granite that it's made from came from the same place the Georgia um, Guidestones are from, Elberton, Georgia. So that granite down here really gets around, you know. Okay, and Highway 25, you can go ahead and advance. Highway 25 is a fascinating place, fascinating place. It runs into Edgefield, which is rich in history. All right, Sheldon Ruins, MSC, South Carolina. How many of you have seen it? It's a pretty popular place. Somebody in here said they'd seen it. It's a beautiful church. You know, Rome has ruins, and I've been there, but so does the South. This is as pretty as anything you'll hope to see anywhere. Interesting story behind it that's changed something lately I'll tell you about. I've never stopped at this place that there wasn't photographers, professional photographers there shooting it. It is a beautiful place to take photographs. A lot of weddings take place there. It's a beautiful outdoor setting provided the weather is okay. It's just a couple stones throw from Yemassee, South Carolina, which is an interesting little spot itself. It's the home site of Harold's Country, Harold's Country Club which is an old 1930s Chevrolet dealership has been made into a rather uh, cult-like following restaurant. It's only open Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. It's on the back roads. It's the kind of place you would have gone to on a Sunday. I-95 is dangerously close. So that they say about Yemassee, it's uh, in the middle of nowhere, but close to everywhere. And that would be true because I-95 is very close by. This is a good photograph in the sense that it doesn't have a fence around it. Today, a fence surrounds it. It was just put up recently because some people thought it was a great idea to go in there and get bricks from the columns for souvenirs. And a young woman thought it would be a great idea to have her photograph taken without any clothes on. And so the Historical Society down there put up a fence. And now it's nowhere near as photogenic. So a lot of what I do, and I'm not the only person that does this kind of stuff. She does it. I know some other people do it. It's an act of preservation when you go out and photograph these old places that many are falling apart and will disappear in time, we're gonna put them in a book somewhere, we're gonna put them on the internet or magazine stories, and you preserve what was something really beautiful and rare for future people to see because it's gonna be gone eventually or it's gonna be changed by our rather less than genteel society. One of the photographs in this presentation is a window unit air conditioning box sitting in the window of an old, old post office in a place called Willington, South Carolina. It's the devil, the evil air conditioning. That was one of the reasons a lot of what we used to do changed gradually. You could not stand the heat, so tra traveling on a Sunday afternoon was a wonderful thing. You get the breeze in your face and you would see these wonderful places. Air conditioning kept us inside. Look Homeward Angel, the Tom Wolfe novel. There it is, that's the Look Homeward Angel that he took the title from. His father made gravestones and um, for a long time that sat at his house and then Tom Wolfe, his father lost it gambling. And so it's on Highway 64 in North Carolina. 
near Hendersonville. I was driving along one day on a back road on a magazine assignment, um, and I saw this statue, this angel with her, arm, her wings outspread. And I went there, and there was a marker, and I could not believe it. It was the Look Homeward Angel, which really kind of gave me a thrill because I love that book. And, of course, it's made out of marble. But it's there, and it's beautiful to see. And Tom Wolfe, you know, was a huge man from Asheville that stood up and would write on the top of his refrigerator as his desk. And he was extremely wordy. So his agent, his editor, um, who's a very famous man's name, escapes me, edited his work and made it a lot better than it was. But that's the kind of thing you're going to see if you start rambling. I, I tell people all the time in my talks, and I have to caution them, don't take the same road to the same place all the time. I know you've got time limits and so forth, but now and then slow down a little bit and deliberately get lost. I love to go down a back road in a county and take a dirt road and then get off that dirt road to a pig path. One of the things I found this past summer with my sister's help was an old cemetery where black and white people were buried in the middle of a thicket of woods and some of the graves had seashells on them. The seashells had been cemented into shape almost like shingles on a roof. I had heard of this, but I'd never seen it. So when I got back to my home, I had my photographs and I said, I'm gonna find out what this is about. And I found out what it's about, it's a very beautiful thing. In reconstruction, salt was a rare thing. And in some of the black communities, the men would get salt teams together and go to the coast with big barrels and they would boil seawater and get the salt. This took days. While they were there, they would fish and pack the fish in the salt to preserve them. And they pulled shells for funeral purposes back home. And here's what they did. The black people liked to have a ridge of soil over their grave. The white people had a flat grave. When it would rain, the waters would wash that ridge away. But not if you covered it with seashells and then lightly cemented them in place. It was like shingles on a roof. And the reason they did it was twofold. To keep that ridge of dirt in place, it was symbolic. It was the sea that brought them to the United States, and they would, next, they would take their voyage the next time would be across a bigger sea. And so they equipped their graves with seashells. And recently I had a person, a lady at a book event, said, we found that cemetery. It was beautiful. We couldn't believe it. I don't know how they found it because my sister had to leave me in there. It's down a dirt road. It's a good many miles. But it's this kind of thing that's out there. Badwell Cemetery, McCormick, South Carolina. Never have I seen such a powerful, small cemetery that really affects you. First of all, it's considered to be haunted. My co-author, Robert Clark, of some other books I've done from the University of South Carolina Press, and I've been there several times working on it. And supposedly it's haunted by a troll. And when you walk to the path at the top of the hill there that goes down to the cemetery where the last of the French Huguenots are buried that tried to make a go of it in a place called New Bordeaux, South Carolina, you see something. In our case, we saw the biggest toad we'd ever seen sitting at the head of that trail like he was watching us. And we took camera gear down and some of the stuff like these gentlemen have, and he never moved. I went there another time, and a black snake was there. I went there another time, and there was another animal there. And I thought, I don't know what a troll is. I know what a shapeshifter is. But I thought, well, you know, maybe this place is haunted. There was another thing about this cemetery that's very eerie. It's made of giant blocks of rock, and the entrance to it was a cast iron door upon which men had put a 1700 sculpture from Italy of the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper is holding his scythe. One foot is frozen in the air as he's stepping over four skulls, and wet wings like buzzards are sprouting out his back. And when he looks at you, it's like he's looking through you. That sculpture was stolen three times by vandals, and finally it was recovered. And we don't know what the situation is. I've tried to get the uh, U.S. Forestry Service to release it to McCormick County, but they want it back. I sit on the art board there, and they want it back, but we're running into a stone wall. But in this particular cemetery, you have buried Dr. Um, Reverend Gervais, Reverend Jean-Louis Gervais, who ate a poisonous mushroom at the age of 51 and died. 
Maybe it looked like something he knew back in France, but it fooled him. So he's buried there. Some of his family members are buried there. But there's something on a stone I saw that was really touching. There was a young girl. If you read all four sides of her tombstone, you get the feeling that she was an only child and she died before her parents did. She died at the age of 25 years, some odd months and days. And there's a quoted a scripture there from Jeremiah 15. Her son went down while it was yet day. I thought it was beautiful. Her son went down while it was yet day. She died before her time. Badwell Cemetery, we've been there many times, is an extremely great place to go visit if you want to see how life used to be. To the right, half a mile or more away, is a spring with a spring house over it built in 1848 or 50, something like that. They took these giant blocks and built another structure over the spring and constructed in such a way that it held water. And they would take pottery bowls and float their food in that cold water. It was an early attempt to refrigerate their food and make it last a little longer before it was spoiled. Between that spring house and this cemetery up on a rise, and it's easy to spot because of the periwinkle, you'll see where the old Badwell Plantation stood. And supposedly it's got its name from a well that was bad. And if you go up here to this place, there is a hand-dug well that you could stumble into. It's very small, very beautiful, covered in periwinkle. It's been covered over a little bit with a grate. That might have been the bad well. And you can find the stones of the foundation and all that. You'll also see something else that's really odd. All the trees look unfamiliar to you, and that's because those men brought trees from other countries and planted them there. There was an avenue of them that went straight down from the plantation, like on a, oak, on a vinegar bottle. And when the U.S. Forest Service took over this area, it's in the Sumter National Forest, they cut all those trees. But there's some trees left that defy identification. In my, in my book, I don't know what they are. And I assume it's something they planted there, they brought maybe from England, I mean uh, France. Badwell Plantation is the place you need to put on your to-do list one day. It's on three, off of 378, off of UG, um, I can't remember the name, UG Road, I think, in, in McCormick County, South Carolina. And it's, it's worth the trip over there to see this place. Right nearby is a ghost town called Mount Carmel, which has a small restaurant in it. It's where the Confederate gold train came through. So you go to this particular area, Rich with Sunday Drive type places to see. Ghost towns, abandoned cemeteries, haunted cemeteries, old ruins of a plantation and a spring house, which I've never seen anything before or since like it. You're looking at a miracle. A miracle. This is Anthony Shoals, which is in Elbert County, Wilts County, with Lincoln County, where I grew up, just barely not quite to it. You have to get to it through Lincoln County. You're looking at the Rocky Shoals spider lily, which is a rare species. It only grows in South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. Some people call it the Cahaba lily, the Catawba lily. It's the Rocky Shoals spider lily. From May to June, for about six to seven weeks, it puts on a spectacular show these blossoms come up once a day and they disappear. These green stems are as green as bell peppers. The wind and the water makes the lilies sway and they're just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Uh, Dr. Davenport from Alabama, who's a world expert on this particular flower, which is not a lily, it's in the jonquil da uh, daffodil family. He said that little old ladies have been known to cry the first time they see it. It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. We took some friends of mine who uh, traveled the world to see this in a place called Stevens Creek, South Carolina, which is not quite as big as this, but it's just as spectacular. And they said, we have traveled the world and seen a lot of beautiful things, but we have never seen anything as beautiful as this. Why is it a miracle? Because this is the Broad River running here, and upstream is the Russell Dam that could have killed it. It's running just to the right here, not even half a mile, into Lake Thurman, which is Clarks Hill Lake to Georgians like us, Clarks Hill Lake. Clarks Hill Lake could have backed over it. Thurman could have killed it. 
somehow it's, there's a free running stretch of the broad river between these two dams, these two lakes, and this particular plant survives. It's personal to me because my mother grew up about six minutes from there. She took me there when I was a boy. I must have been five. I have one memory. They caught fish and fried them in cast iron frying pans. And of course, all my family members are dead now. Uncle Carol, he's dead. He showed me how to take sand and scour this cast iron frying pan until it gleamed like silver. And I remember seeing water and rocks. It was in the summertime, so there were no lilies. But this is where I went. And I'd written about it as being destroyed by two dams. And then I found out I was wrong. And I was never more glad in my life to be wrong about something. This is the most spectacular show in the southeast from mid-May to June when the Rocky Shoal spider lilies come into bloom. You'll see um, hummingbirds and beautiful butterflies and damselflies on them. If you get real quiet there and stand in the edge of the woods alongside the shoals and just make yourself invisible. I used to be in wildlife cinematography, I made wildlife films in the 80s. The wildlife will come out. I had an osprey to drop into the water as far as here as the wall. And I photographed it. He caught a fish so big he couldn't get up. He sat in the water like, what in the devil do I do now? He couldn't lift it. He let go of the fish and flew off, and I got great shots of it. It's a place where you can really see the natural world as it was and still is in some places. It's not easy to get to. There's two ways, down a steep bluff or by water. It's a well-kept secret, well-kept secret. But it's one of the largest colonies of um, this particular flower in the southeast, the, other, the largest being at Lansford Canal in um, uh, South Carolina, Chester, South Carolina. Now, um, you can see pockets of them here and there in certain little rivers, but these are the colonies, they call them, and they're really something to see. This is in Lawrence, South Carolina, and the first time I saw this, I was going to a library to speak, and I about broke my neck when I went by this place. There's a couple that moved here, and they decided to take this old service station and make it, a, they call it the nostalgic station. It's got old Coke machines inside, old authentic signs, and once a week on Fridays, they have, have a classic car gathering there, and they ride around in their classic cars. It's a chance to see the kind of cars that people rode in during the days of the Sunday drive. You know, um, the 60s brought in the cars with the big fins. Remember those? My dad had a 1961 Plymouth. The fin on that thing was tremendous. It, was, it looked bizarre today if we saw them. But you go there and you routinely see these old cars from the 50s, and early 60s, and they have this gathering place uh, where they get these cars together in Lawrence, South Carolina. And Lawrence itself is a pretty interesting place with old Victorian homes and all. It's off the beaten path a little bit. But that's a great place to kind of get a flavor of how things used to look when people had these old classic cars, many of which didn't have air conditioning. And they tool around the south in these things. And so when I go there, I, I sort of get that feeling. And I put it in the book because I thought it was just a beautiful old place. You never know what you're going to find. You never know what you're going to find. My sister, the sister of my daughter back here, lives up near um, Apex, North Carolina. All right, when she first moved up there, I would go I-20 to I-95, which was a miserable experience. After I started doing these books, I said, you know, you're, you're, not, an, you're not a good example of what you're telling people to do. So I looked at a map, a paper map, a real map, and I saw that if I took I-20 for about 30 minutes and went into Camden, South Carolina, and took old U.S. North, U.S. 1 North, I could avoid 95. And that's when I came across a little spot in the road called Cassett, South Carolina. I've been going by this place for a year or two, and every time I drive by this little outdoor grocery store, there was this mannequin, Albert's his name, on a hand truck. They keep him on a hand truck so they can roll him in at night and roll him out in the morning. Now, why would they do that? The store has two businesses. The gentleman that runs it up front, who looks just like Phil Fulmer, that was the coach at Tennessee, they're twins, they look just alike. He does all the grocery stuff. His wife is in the back room where she has about 10 sewing machines, colored spools of thread everywhere. She makes dolls. She makes custom dolls for people for whatever purpose they want. And she made Albert 
as a kind of advertisement. His, his beard is made from a mop. He's got great blue eyes. People run over Albert on purpose. Children, t- teenagers have vandalized and pulled his hands off. She keeps rebuilding him. Not recently, I stopped, recently I stopped by there and a truck had hit him. She keeps rebuilding Albert. He's got more lives than nine lives than a cat's got. And they keep putting him out by the side of the road on old US-1. Well, old US-1 used to be the road of the backbone of the East Coast, from New York to Miami. It's been relegated to back road status in some places now because there's very little traffic. You see sites like this, you go through peach orchards. You can follow Sherman's route north out of the Carolinas on this road. It's plain to see. There's Chiral, South Carolina, where Dizzy uh, Gillespie grew up. You can find his statue with his bent bell trumpet. But I like Albert best of all because of his perseverance and endurance in the face of vandalism and trucks that run over him. And he's quite a guy, and I wrote about him. And so uh, I stopped by there one day after I put him in a book and I'd written some newspaper columns. And uh, the lady, she said, her name's Kathy, she says, we got a lot more business now thanks to you. She said, people just come here to see Albert. And I said, well, great. That's, that's what we want to do. Right down the road is a guy who builds yard art. You can get any kind of concrete yard art you want. Bird baths, flower pedestals, and 15 feet gorillas made out of fiberglass. And I guess if you're a Gamecock fan, big roosters, um, elephants, that'd be for Alabama, I guess. I think I saw a pink elephant there once. And so you see these kinds of sights when you get on these roads that are sort of obscure now. When you get on the interstate, you're going to see this. Trucks, traffic jams, construction barrels, and sterile shoulders with nothing to see. So here's what I really want you to go home and think about. Don't do what I'm telling you to do because I don't want to get a back road someday and all of you are out there on it. Okay? I want to keep it to myself. It's really quite a treasure. There's an old store in Greenwood County where it's closed, it's abandoned. They could not find classic signs to put on their store, so they painted them on there. These are painted signs that you see, old soft drinks and what have you. It's in Greenwood County. I wrote about that too in a column. And uh, you know, one of the problems I've run into in some of these country stores is one in Edgefield where they took down the old RC Cola and Camel signs after I did a story on them because they were terrified people were going to steal them. So in a way, you have to blame me for being a, a guy that causes trouble with my photographs and stories. So there's always a knife that cuts two ways. But that's, that's the case with this situation here. And um, this place is abandoned. But the one thing they will never have to worry about is somebody stealing those signs, unless you want to cut the boards out, OK? Dinner on the Grounds. I wrote a story called Dinner on the Grounds. When I was growing up in New Hope Baptist Church in Lincoln County, Georgia, we didn't have the fancy smancy air conditioned fellowship hall. We had cedar trees and concrete blocks and granite slabs about this high that you would stand at and eat Sunday dinner on the grounds after church for whatever reason, revival, what have you. And it was great. Uh, the flies were always bothering you. And we, were, we kids were kind of squeamish about eating somebody else's fried chicken. I would look for my mama's dishes so I knew what her food was to get my food, you know. And so what happened is we got a preacher in that church. That didn't, he didn't like that. And he had them uh, cut the cedar trees and tear down these. This is a church called Little Stevens Baptist Creek, uh, Little Stevens Creek Baptist Church in Edgefield off Highway 430. And um, this is exactly how it looked, though, in my, in my home church growing up. Now they have these fellowship halls, which look kind of like a restaurant. And like my grandson back there, if he were to go to one, it wouldn't strike him like it did me, standing up to eat outdoors on a hot Sunday afternoon, home-cooked meals, where's mama's chicken? I don't want to eat that chicken. It looks too greasy. And, you know, you you'd walk around and you stand there. It was fabulous. You still have these memories. So... It's, it surprises me sometimes what I write about. I'll think, well, this won't get much reaction. But this got a lot of reaction from older folks that remembered this very thing. Now it's fashionable to have a building outside your church, a fellowship hall, that's kind of like, um, like a meeting facility. There's not much to it. Okay? All right. 
beautiful word, Esmeralda. This is the Esmeralda Inn in North Carolina, Chimney Rock. I stayed there for a night doing a story for uh, North Carolina Magazine, and um, I had remembered the Esmeralda Inn before it burned. In the 1930s, it was a fashionable place for people like Clark Gable and Hollywood movie stars to come stay there, and I think they shot some movies there. Then it burnt. How many of you ladies were Patrick Swayze fans? Dirty Dancing? Can we say Dirty Dancing in a library on Sunday? Can we do that? The floor of the Esmeralda Inn was rebuilt using the floor that Patrick Swayze danced on in Dirty Dancing. They got it from the Boys Club at Lake Lure, and there it is. I, told, I started telling people that, and women went, I gotta go there, I gotta see this place. <laughs> it's a fabulous place, and Chimney Rock is really interesting too. Esmeralda, Spanish, you know what it means? Orchids, for a family of orchids, Esmeralda. I always thought it was the most beautiful name. And it's a beautiful place too, all the wood and everything. But the old place that burned was a lot more authentic and a lot more Sunday drive worthy, but this is still not a bad place to check out, okay? We either missed two or I'm gonna catch up on you in a minute. <laughs> yes, here we go. All right, Seaview Inn, Pauley's Island, South Carolina. Hard to get there, totally on a back road because you're gonna come into that Myrtle Beach influence down the Grand Strand. I love this place for one reason. They don't accept credit cards. <laughs> they don't have a menu. You make a reservation, you show up, and you eat whatever they've cooked. And guess what? No air conditioning. Oh, wow. No air conditioning. We're talking 1950s now, my kind of place. Good food, sea breeze, the Atlantic Ocean's right beyond those windows. The sea breeze blows through. It's a throwback to a time that doesn't exist anymore. It's been bought by new people, a couple from here in Atlanta, young couple that own it. And uh, you can make your reservation there, and you show up, you tell them your name, and on the table will be a little silver support with an envelope that's got your name on it. And you put your money in there, and they'll come pick it up, and uh, ladies in white aprons, come out of a kitchen with food, it is fabulous. It is a wonderful experience like going back in the 1950s. No air conditioning, no credit cards. And just to the right is a beautiful lobby with a library built into it. And she told me, one of the ladies there, she said, we have writers that come stay here and live upstairs for a while when they're working on their books and things. I said, it must be very nice. The, the Sea View Inn on Pauly's Island, no air conditioning, okay? And there it is. There it is, the devil that started everything. I remember a day in, in uh, the summer growing up in Georgia. We had no air conditioning. It wasn't a Sunday. I don't know what it was. It might have been a Saturday. I guess school was out because I was in school then. I was real young, maybe seven or eight years old. It was so hot, it forced me to go back into Georgia's climate, climate, climate records, and I found out that it was a day when the temperature reached 100 and 12 or 14 degrees in Jefferson County, Georgia, which wasn't that far away. That would be Louisville, Georgia, to some of you. And Daddy went to town to the Western Auto, and he bought a box fan. And he brought it to the house, and he put it on a table. And Mama took her aluminum ice, chest, uh, ice cube trays out and cracked them and sat them in front of the fan. And we all sat down in front of it where the wind could blow on us to get some relief from the heat. That's how hot it was, you know? And air conditioning has ruined us now because we can't take the heat like we used to. It used to, it used to be not so bad, but it can really be tough now when you get you know, used to climate control and all that. But it's in your car, you go in your garage, you go in your house, you never outside, you go to the store, you walk in the mall, you walk in the Publix, wherever, air conditioning, air conditioning, air conditioning. I wouldn't mind if we went back to not having it. It would be a good lesson for us. It might give us an indication where we're headed if it's really hot, you know. You might want to straighten up and fly right, as my mother used to say. But that's it, the old box unit, which led to heat pumps and all this, you know, stuff we got today we take for granted, central air, okay? This is a very interesting guy. 
He does roadside art without asking anyone's permission. He found a church that had a glider they didn't want anymore for some reason. How does a church end up with a glider? <laughs> this is near Highway 34 in Winsboro, South Carolina. So this guy goes up and puts a glider in a tree and wires it in there, has a guy hanging off the limb, and people come driving along minding their business and see this and they dial 911. There's been a plane crash here at the site of so-and-so and so-and-so. This guy did, I think they called him Crazy Bob. He did other installations on his own. And I finally tracked him down and talked to him. He didn't really want to talk to me too much about it. I said, I'd like to meet you and interview you and do a story on you. He says, I'm too busy. He does this kind of stuff and he does other things. You won't see something like this on a busy road. You just won't see it. Um, the crazy art, the guy who wants to amuse you with his fake crash, the old country stores, you just won't see any of that anymore like you, you used to unless you go look for it, okay? Okononichi Racetrack, Hillsborough, North Carolina. My daughter Beth called me up one day. She said, Daddy, you got to come see this place and write a story about it. I said, what you got? She said, it was NASCAR's second racetrack. It's a dirt track. It's been abandoned. The bathroom still exists, outdoor huts. The grandstand is cracked and full of weeds and trees growing all over. It's still there. There's quite a story behind it. Bill France, the brainstorm behind NASCAR, was flying over Orange County, which is called, when he saw this dirt track below that's pretty big. He bought it from a guy who was um, a colonel. It was nine-tenths of a mile. The only other track NASCAR had at the time was half a mile. This was a big track. Petty, Fireball Roberts, Junior Johnson, those kind of guys raced it and they loved it. They could go faster there than any track they'd ever been on. So it's a super success. Bill France decides, this is where I'm gonna build my first mega super raceway. And so he lets the people of Hillsborough, North Carolina know what his intentions are. And remember NASCAR races on what day of the week? Sunday usually, used to be, it's changed a little bit, Sundays. Seven little ladies and a preacher told him, no sir, racing's too loud for the Lord's day. And they fought him, and they fought him. Well, he said, you know, okay, there's some people in a place called Talladega I'm talking to. I might just try it there. They could have been Talladega. But the interesting thing about this racetrack is you can still go there. People walk their dogs, jog and whatnot, walkers. And you can still see the back straightaway. You can see the third and fourth turns, the first and second turns. And the second turn is where a tremendous thing happened. Fireball Roberts lost control there in one of their races and spun out and hit a tree. And a bunch of men had climbed that tree so they wouldn't have to pay the price of admission to see the race. And the next thing they know, they're falling down on Fireball Roberts' car. And it's like that old song, It's Raining Men. Had a great bunch of history behind it. There was a river, the Eno River right by it. People would cross the river and sneak in. So he was having a lot of problems with this racetrack. But ok Okanichi is still there and it's really a historical site as NASCAR goes, which I never was much of a NASCAR fan after Richard Petty got out. But Richard Petty won the last race there, it was 1964, and then they closed it down. I think the purse was something like $5,700. And so uh, it was very fondly remembered by the old guard race cars drivers because they could really go fast there, but not Talladega fast, okay. <laughs> Chattooga River, not too far from here. Very interesting place to go take a drive to. You go certain times a year, you'll see the mountain law, rhododendron in bloom. You'll see this is the water right before you get to Bull Sluice where Deliverance was filmed. Anybody here remember Deliverance? You know, the guy that wrote that, it lived here once in Atlanta, James Dickey. He ended up in Columbia. I got to know him. He wrote the foreword for my first book. He told me all about how and why he did this. And the Chattooga River is one of the only uh, rivers like this in the southeast. It's very dangerous. Um, I went down it several years ago doing a magazine story at a place called Seven Foot Falls. The river was down a little bit. 
We had a young man who was our guide in one of those big blue and yellow um, rafts. He looked like Jesus with his beard. But I found out something about him. When we capsized at Seven Foot Falls, he could not walk on water. He went down with us. I thought I was going to drown. I got trapped under the raft. It was a pretty unnerving experience. But I came out of it, and I thought about this place a lot. and said, you know, if my father could only have taken me to see something like this when I was a kid, it might have changed my life. I would have wanted to do something like run rivers. I thought it was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. It's a 51-mile stretch, 51 mile stretch of river. It's one of the only free-flowing rivers in the south. It's never been dammed. Forms at Whiteside Mountain when the rains gather, and it comes down into the watershed and becomes the raging Chattooga River, which has killed 40-something people now since deliverance came out. It killed so many in the beginning that Dickey was upset about it. He felt guilty, and then the Forest Service took it over and started regulating things. You couldn't just get two guys in an old canoe or, or inner tubes on there anymore. You had to, like, go through an outfitter. So, and the kayakers go in there still. But it, it was a, a good thing that was necessary, I guess. But what's really nice about this place is it's an unspoiled streak of nature. And you can see, if you take a drive there, you can see the very same things the Cherokee Indians saw when they were here. It has not changed a bit. If you look up and see an airplane going over, that would be the only difference. I love it for that reason alone. Okay. Not far from here, Watson Mill Bridge. Watson Mill Covered Bridge. South Carolina has one. The Campbell's Covered Bridge up in Greenville County. This is not far from here. It's Georgia's longest. I think Georgia has something like 27 covered bridges. It's in the 20s. Those are wonderful places to go if you want to get a serene sense of how things used to be. Uh, a great back road trip, a great Sunday drive trip. I've been there many times. You get a very peaceful, easy feel in there. It's sort of like an eagle song. Sounds like an eagle song. But it's a, a picnic area. People can get out in the shallow water and um, get in, you know, cool off there. And of course, you know why they covered the bridge, don't you? Anybody know? So the wooden floorboards of it wouldn't rot from the rains and everything. And of course, what's happened to most covered bridges, there was a lot of it at one time. Vandals had burned them, and sometimes it was an accidental burning where somebody was building a fire and got away from them. But the Watson Mill Bridge is a fabulous place to take a Sunday drive to. I would like to see you do that, to get, to get out of town and go see some of these places. It was a tradition that was really cherished by a lot of people. You knew you were going to do it. It was something you could look forward to. I enjoyed it so much sitting in the back of my mom and dad's car, seeing sights I'd never seen. Um, we, we grew up kind of isolated, and we weren't exactly run over with money. And to take a Sunday afternoon trip and see something like a train, an old country store, um, a beautiful natural area, was to me as good as going to Europe. And I think somehow it got into my blood because as a grown man, I ended up writing about nature and the back roads, almost, I say, accidental way. Sometimes I think about it at night when I can't sleep and I realize it's kind of what I wanted to do anyway. I like the city. As James Salter wrote in his book, Burning the Days, the city's where the women are. It's also where a lot of trouble is, too. And these places are peaceful and really they sort of rejuvenate your soul. I'm going to close on uh, one thing that I saw with this young lady over here. It's very surprising what you'll find if you trespass. I do a lot of trespassing. I have a press credentials from South Carolina Press Association, which gets me out of trouble sometimes. And I have letters on me from publishers, directors, that says this gentleman's working on a book about so-and-so and so-and-so. If you don't mind, give him access to whatever you want. I've only been run off of one place once. We stopped in an old farmhouse one summer day off of 378, which is in South Carolina and Georgia, but we're in South Carolina. It was a Victorian-era farmhouse. It was absolutely beautiful. It was also absolutely rotting down. You could not go up the steps too quickly with your step because you might punch through the wood. The porch was more of the same. We went into this room. I looked to the left, and I saw an old enamel sink nailed onto the wall. No plumbing, just nailed onto the wall. But in this room where we were was a wooden trunk, huge, big as that table. Nothing else. And I said, who moved? And why would they leave this trunk here? Did I look in it? What do you think? 
I did. I opened it up, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was beautiful vintage women's hats wrapped in tissues. Some of them looked like the flappers' hats of the 20s. And I told her, I said, got to photograph this. She says, we've got to get out of here now. She pointed in the ceiling. It was a wasp nest about this big. And several hundred wasps were doing this. We couldn't run because we might punch through the floor. Got out of there. Didn't get stung. I wrote about it a little bit. I didn't think I gave too much directions on where the place was, but she went back recently and someone had been in that trunk and had left some of the hats onto the floor there. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like being an explorer, like Indiana Jones going to some of these places. The treasures you find, old stone factories where cotton used to be shipped and so forth. It's out there. So I encourage you sometimes, you don't have to take a fancy vacation. Just take a Sunday drive once in a while. and Make it a Saturday drive if you want to. Go out on the back roads and get a camera and take pictures of some of these places. They're out there waiting on you. I encourage you to do it. That's all I got to say. Okay. This one feels hot. Okay. Read it aloud. Mary Rebus. Go, Mary. We'll okay. Give you a All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Can you take your seat? Right. I will. Well, thank you again to Tom and to all of you for coming out today to Gwinnett County Public Library. We really appreciate it. The books are still for sale. If you have a question, come on up and meet him, or he'd be happy to autograph a copy. Sure will. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, too. Thank you very thank much. You. Kind of throw it off.